So part two of Kant's groundwork, right? We continue our journey through this uh, exciting work. <laughs> and um, we are now, so let me just summarize what we've done so far and then what we need to look for now. We've talked about the two forces, instinct, reason, and we looked at how the voice of instinct is always thinking about happiness. When we are making a decision and we're thinking, oh, this would be good for me, and even when we're thinking of the happiness of others, right, this would be good for them, we are still, for Kant, on a lower moral ground. We are still thinking only about happiness, right? And this counts for my happiness, but also the happiness of others, right? Making other people happy is not necessarily moral. <laughs> this is very important for all of us out there who are pleasers, right? I, I anyway, Actually, let me ask, how many of you are pleaser type? Anybody in the, in the class is a kind of a pleaser? Uh, okay, so Donaldson, uh, who else? Raise your hand, don't be ashamed. Um, uh, Suleimanov, Dabi, right? Um, okay, so a lot of us, right, we're pleasers and we think that's the right thing to do. But what we're learning here, right, is that pleasing others is not necessarily always the right thing to do. Sometimes there's a higher law, right? And we have to look into that. So now we're going to turn to that. We're going to look at the, what reason sounds like, what reason stands for. Uh, so, that some, so that we can begin to hear that voice too, right? For most of us, the voice of instinct is so powerful that most of our actions are guided by the quest for pleasure, for happiness, right? And we don't even hear that other voice, even though we all have it, according to Kant, right? So in order to become more attuned to it, he has written this work so that we can begin to, to, to hear it better. We can begin to identify it, to recognize it, right? Okay, so let's go into that. So we're in the second part now of the groundwork and I'm gonna start here on uh, page, where am I? Uh, um, page 34. Yeah, page 34. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna read on the top of page 34. Here philosophy is seen. How many of you are with me? Put your hand on the screen. Okay, thank you. So here philosophy is seen, in fact, to be put in a precarious position, right? Which should be firm, even though there is neither in heaven nor on earth anything upon which it depends or is based. So let's, let's look at that. This here is Kant is reiterating things we know already, right? He's saying, what I'm about to tell you, the voice you should follow is found neither in heaven nor on earth. So let's, let's stop on that a little bit and see what he means that, by that. He's, he's being somewhat poetic, right? Heaven, earth. These are metaphors. Uh, this is a rare poetic moment in Kant. So what does it mean when he says that voice, which you should listen to, is not found in heaven? What is he alluding to here? Can anyone tell me? You can raise your hand, virtual hand. Uh, Donaldson, go ahead. I think he's referring to the fact that like uh, they're sort of moving away from religion and like that God may not not have the answers okay absolutely right first thing he says the voice you seek when you're about to make a difficult decision is not going to be found in religion it's not going to be found in the scriptures it's not going to you know sound from the heavens right and uh in a way he's right right many decisions i mean you know the the scriptures have a few guidelines but it's sometimes you you're looking for a specific answer and <laughs> so in general right in the 18th century where kant is writing right or is it 17th? I think it's the 18th, right? Uh, we are not going to rely on those things anymore, right? So then he continues and says, neither on earth should you seek this voice. What does earth represent? <clears throat> well, make sure you raise your virtual hand. What does earth represent? Uh, Sanchez, I see your hand is up, go ahead. Oh yeah, I was gonna say like with the heaven and earth thing, like he's, he's basically saying like, neither those people who are religious, neither those people who aren't religious, um, can um, can precisely pinpoint it, and you have to you have to think of it outside of the box and kind of go against your own beliefs or or whatever you already believe to see even further. Okay, excellent, right? So the earth is more the earthly. This is the maybe the voice of the state, right? Maybe the voice of law, <clears throat> maybe the voice of nature, right? There are many part many places where philosophers were looking for answers right so uh <clears throat> one way some of us you know we we decide what to do we follow the law the law of the land right but we know sometimes the law of the land is going to be 
morally problematic, right? Uh, I mean, we know this from the time of the Nazis, right? The law of the land was you will give us, surrender to us all of the Jewish people you know, and people were hiding these people, right? So they were breaking the law of the land in the name of something higher. So, so the earth is not going to guide you, right? Another way to understand the earth here is the laws of nature. Many people follow nature when it comes to um, uh, moral guidance, right? We try to follow how nature is doing things. And when something is quote unquote unnatural, we say it's immoral, right? This argument, by the way, has been used, right? To, to go against the gay marriage, right? Saying, ah, it's unnatural, <laughs> right? We follow nature, right? Now, by the way, people have found since then, you know, many instances of homosexual partnership in nature, right? But in general, right, people will give you that argument. Now, I'll, I'll, uh, Kant would say, well, nature is not a very good guide. And, and I agree with him. I'll give you an example. So some time ago, when I was young, when I was in, I guess, elementary school, I had had a particularly bad day at school. And I was like, oh, let me just go home and watch TV, right? But not something toxic. Let me just watch. And I figured, oh, let me watch the nature channel, right? I'm just going to relax and see animals frolic in the wild. And it's going to purify me. So I, I turn on the TV and I, I see, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a broadcast on, uh, you know, seals, those little cute seals, you know, with little faces, right? Who are in the, up there in the north, in the ocean, right? Um, so I'm, I'm watching the seals and I'm happy. I'm starting to feel purified. I see a, a baby seal there and then I see a daddy seal and then I see the daddy seal go to the baby seal. And then the daddy seal does something terrible to the baby seal. And then I'm like, what is happening here? And then the voice is explaining. And this is what it, I'm so sorry to corrupt your young minds, but this is what is happening in the Arctic as we speak, right? When there's not enough women <laughs> seals in the Arctic, the men will often go right to their offspring <laughs> that has just been born <laughs> in order to mate. It was crushing. I was like, this is hideous. This is horrible. I wanted to purify myself and now I'm even more toxic, right? So nature is a terrible guide. That was my, my deduction. Nature is a terrible guide when it comes to morality. You will not find guidance there, right? So neither in the heavens nor on the earth. And of course, where, according to Kant, can we find guidance? Remind me. You can put your virtual hand up. Where is the only place we ought to listen to and find guidance, according to Kant? Reminder, please. You know this. <laughs> you can put it in the chat if you're too lazy to raise your hand. That's fine. Uh, Sanchez, go ahead. Within ourselves, the voice of reason. <laughs> exactly, right? Yeah. <laughs> right. Within <laughs> ourselves, right? The voice of reason. We, our higher selves, is the only authority we should bow to, right? Not ourselves, right? Because that could be instinct. We're not supposed to bow to instinct. We're supposed to bow to our higher selves, which is reason, right? So now we have to figure out what is reason saying? Why, what does reason stand for, right? So here we're gonna go to page uh, 35. And I'm gonna be in the second paragraph right in the middle. On the left, you will see a capital H in the middle of the second paragraph. Hence, tell me when you are there, the word hence, one, two, three, thank you. Okay, I'm gonna start reading there. Okay, hence, concepts. There arises a distinction between subjective ends, which rest on incentives, and objective ends, which depend on motives valid for every rational being. Okay, so it sounds like the same old thing, but there are some new things that have been added. So first of all, he distinguishes between what he calls subjective ends. So this is a subjective goal. This is a goal for you, right? Subjective. And then he has objective ends. So this is a goal beyond you, right? And the first goal, which is about you, he says rests on incentives, meaning you're doing it because it will bring you happiness because it's good for you, right? And then he says objective ends on the other hand has a different objective. And it is an objective where you are taking into account not just you, but every rational being. Okay, so let me reiterate, make sure you write this down. There's two paths. First one is the path of instinct, right? You're thinking of subjective ends. This is instinct. You're thinking here of what's good for me, <laughs> right? Incentives. And then the second path, which is the path of reason, this is objective ends. And here you're thinking no more of yourself. You're not thinking what's good for me. You're not even thinking what's good for them. You're thinking 
in terms of I need to keep in mind and keep before me the concept of rational being. Okay, so we have, of course, now this is a new idea, the notion of rational being we haven't thought, we haven't looked at yet. And so we have to figure out, before we can figure out what reason stands for, we have to figure out what does Kant mean by rational being. So is everyone with me so far? It's kind of it, it pretty dense, right? Okay, good. All right, so we need to explore that. Now, interestingly, Kant uh, defines the rational being and the last paragraph. Okay, so let's go there. Now I say, tell me if you're there. Now I say that man. Okay, thank you. Okay, now I say that man, so he's about to define a rational being. Now I say that man, and in general, every rational being, so he's defining, exists, this is the definition, as an end in himself, and not merely as a means to be arbitrarily used by this or that will. That is the definition. Now, can anyone translate to me what he's saying? What does a rational, what makes a rational being what is the definition of a rational being for Kant? Can anyone understand what he said here? He exists as an end and not as a means to be used. Can anyone, does anyone have the courage to translate in ordinary language what Kant just said? Let's see if there's anybody who is brave to do that. So in other words, when you're looking at a rational being, when you're looking at somebody and you say, ah, here's a rational being, you are going to be seeing them not as an end, uh, sorry, not as a means, but as an end. Okay, Sanchez, you're courageous. Go ahead, tell me. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I um, understand that what he's trying to say is that there's more than just what we're doing now, that we have to work towards something greater near our end, uh, near like going to, towards our lives into the world and what we can be, um, how we can make a good change for humanity after we've passed and and so on and so forth for I'm guessing will be the rest of you know time or generations to come. Um, okay, good. Yes, yeah. he's definitely trying to broaden right our perspective beyond just what is good for me now, right? Yeah. But more specifically, and I guess Rudolph, you can answer this question. You can try also. What does it mean, right, to see someone as an end and not merely as a means? And then Fatakov, you can you can. I it. interpreted it as being the person that may be well grounded and and wise and reasonable and logical, but also enlightened. And the person who. What does it mean to be enlightened? <laughs> enlightened meaning having reached that plateau of higher him or herself, recognizing that um, there is a, a higher uh, virtue to achieve and okay. using that to judge. Okay, excellent, right? Like Sanchez is saying, there's a higher authority and we're, we're, but we're still trying to zoom in what is a rational being. Fatakov, can you help us with that definition? Yeah, I agree with what Damien and Axel both said, uh, but I have a somewhat different interpretation, although it might be similar in terms of its roots. Um, I think that, you know, a rational being is someone for whom all of the actions that they are involved in or that they uh, try to involve, them, involve themselves in have to have some kind of purpose. It's not just, you know, out of the blue. There has to be a certain underlying uh, uh, fundamental explanation for, you know, why is a person pursuing a certain course of action and not a different one? And okay. that's Sorry. my personal take. Okay, good. Again, the notion of a purpose beyond the, the self, but I'm still not getting my definition of rational being. The, the, what I read, what go to what I read, exists as an end in himself and not merely as a means. That's the definition of a rational being. What does this sentence mean? That's what I want to know. Donaldson, can you help us? All right. So I think that a rational being is someone who makes choices for themselves and is not easily swayed by inclinations. Uh, yes, except he's looking here. So I want to be precise so you guys will understand. He's looking here, not at ourselves, right? He's saying when you're making a decision, you, right? 
you're not looking at for your own happiness you're looking and you're caring for you're thinking about the notion of rational being right you're looking and you're thinking and you're standing for the rational being in front of you right so he's talking here about the person you're about to make a decision about right because most moral decisions have to do with decisions with regards to people there's no moral decision between eating a cupcake, a cupcake and then a hamburger, right? It's not a moral decision. Moral decisions involve people. So Kant is saying when you're about to make this decision, which involves people, you will not think about your own happiness. You will think of them as a rational being. Are you so make sure you write this down, right? I'm clarifying now because some, uh, you're not getting what, what he's saying. So let me say it again so you can write it down, right? What he's talking about is you're about to make a decision and you have two paths. The first path is, and this, uh, sorry, you're about to make a decision. This decision involves people. This is important. It involves people. All moral decisions involve people. If it doesn't involve people, it's not going to be a moral decision, right? There's no moral decision between, you know, going to Hawaii for vacation or going to uh, whatever, Pittsburgh. <laughs> it's not a moral thing. No moral decision between eating a pizza and a hamburger. Moral decision is how you're going to deal with this person, right? Now, you have two ways of dealing with that person. You will either think of your own happiness, which we know that's instinct, or you will see them and protect them and safeguard them as a rational being. Okay, so uh, I need to make sure everybody got that. Are you following? Hand in the screen if, you, if you're following where I am now. Okay, now, so what does it mean to see them and to protect them and to safeguard them as a rational being? Well, Kant says this, it means that you will see them as an end in themselves and not just as a means to be used by this or that will. Now I will ask again, what is the definition of a rational being? What are you choosing then to safeguard in that person as you're about to make your decision? What are you choosing to not do or to do as you're about to make a decision for that person? So let's see now if you can answer that question. <clears throat> What does it mean to see them as an end and not merely as a means to be arbitrarily used by this or that will? <clears throat> uh, okay, Sanchez, go ahead. I think what he's trying to say is that we should see, um, we should see people not as just who they may seem to be, but a, more, a lot more of a collective whole, you know, of the world, you know, um, of the universe, I guess you could say, that we have to be selfless and altruistic and not just think of the immediate uh, happiness of the person, but the overall happiness of yeah. Good, yeah. very close, especially in what you said, it's a way of seeing them. Okay? Yeah, so perception, yeah. Uh, Souvenance, you said something in the chat. Are you willing to share out loud what you said in the chat? Or are you still? I just said respecting them. What does that mean to respect? Tell me. Respect them for who they are. Uh, uh, um, what do you mean? Um, like, what can I say? What is said? What is to protect them and not use them for your own happiness or their okay. happiness. Finally. Okay. <laughs> yes. Kant here, uh, I'll get it off in a bit, right? Kant here is talking about respect. He, I'll, I'll, we'll read the passage on respect in a second. What Kant is saying is when you're about to make a decision, you will, be, you, you will have the option to do something which is good for you, or you will have the option to respect that person. Our, you, the, the moral voice of reason is always gonna be asking you in this decision, am I respecting this person's dignity? Okay, let me say it again, right? This is what reason sounds like. This is what we were looking for, right? Reason is always gonna ask you this question as you're about to take a step. Am I in this step, in this decision, respecting this person, this dignity? And what does it mean to respect? It means when you're tempted to use them to your own benefit, you curb that temptation and you, stand, you, you decide not to use them. You, you see them as valuable in themselves and not just what they can bring you. That's what it means here, exists as an end, meaning they have value in themselves and not just as a means to be used. A human being is never just something you can use for your own benefit. And reason is always going to stand for that truth. 
Okay, let me say that again so, so, so that you guys can really write this down. What reason stands for is the dignity of other people. Reason is always going to pipe up when it senses that what you're about to do is, a, is, is use that person for your own benefit. It will always complain when you're about to do that. So you can, of course, have fun with people. You can enjoy people. You can you know, make you know, different uh, decisions about people. But as soon as a decision becomes self-serving and hits and um, what's the word um, and, and, and breaches the dignity of that person in, in, in as much as you're using them now and not just loving them for who they are, you are now committing a moral uh, uh, breach, right? So let's, let's look at the definition of respect so we can have uh, even more clear definition. So I'll turn to page um, 36, uh, the top, right? On the other hand, rational beings, so he's still defining are called persons, in as much as their nature always, so again, marks them out as ends in themselves, i.e. as something which is not to be used merely as a means. And here's the key. Hence, there is imposed a limit on all arbitrary use of such beings, which are thus objects of respect. In other words, reason is always going to limit you when, what your, when your happiness starts to take away the dignity of other people. In other words, reason, in other words your, what reason is doing is that your happiness stops where the dignity of another human begin, begins. Okay, let me say that again, right? Our happiness stops where the dignity of another human being begins. So you can, in, you can follow instinct as much as you want. In fact, it is recommended to follow instinct, right? Instinct will bring you happiness. But if your instinct now is leading you to use another human being like you would use any other object in the world, reason is going to sound the alarm and say, ah, that's not an object like other objects. This particular dimension is sacred. This particular dimension you will not transgress, you will not breach, you will not attempt to control, to master, to possess, to use. This here is a person, right? So let me say that again, right? So you can write this down. We, for Kant, Kant is not against instinct, right? I want to emphasize that. We should make instinctual decisions because instinct will bring you happiness. But there will be times where your instinct will begin to breach or trespass upon the dignity of another human being. You will be tempted to use them, to control them, to manipulate them, to seduce them, to you know, master them. And at that moment, reason will sound the alarm, right? Because reason will always stand for the dignity of another human being. Reason will always stand for the fact that the di dimension of the human being is a sacred dimension which you cannot trespass upon. Right? The human being will not be controlled, will not be mastered, will not be discarded, will not be used, will not be abused. Right? Anytime you start to transgress the dignity of an, another human being, reason will sound the alarm. Right? So are we clear now what is reason standing for? Are you following? Put your hand in the screen if you're with me. Right? So, so it's not about the other person's happiness as much as it is about the other person's dignity, right? Let me say that again, right? It's not so much about the other person's happiness as it is <laughs> about the other person's dignity. You are not, we are not there to please each other, according to Kant. We are not on this earth, right? The, the highest purpose is not to make each other happy. The highest purpose says Kant, or says your higher reason, because Kant is just describing, right? is to protect the dignity of other human beings. And sometimes this will entail going against their happiness, <laughs> right? Now, let's be clear. When Kant talks about a rational being, it's not just the other person, it's also us. So let me add this, right? We ought not only to respect other human beings' dignity, we have to also protect our own dignity. Right, we are also rational beings. So this is the next thought, right? Make sure you jot this down that we don't, we are not only to respect other people and respect their dignity. Reason is also gonna stand for us, for our dignity. In other words, we also have a duty to stand up for our dignity and not let other people use us, abuse us, control us, manipulate us, seduce us, right? We have to also stand up for ourselves. And this is the only time in this class, right? Or one of the rare times in this class where we're going to really talk about the self, 
right? That we also have duties towards ourselves, <laughs> right? If your desire to please the other, or if your love, right? Going back to the topic of love, if your love is such that you're ready to lose your dignity, right? To lose your values, to lose your integrity, to let the other person control you, you are committing a moral breach, right? You are, you, we ought also to respect ourselves in the love relationship, right? We cannot, we're not just there to respect others, people, other people's dignity, we should also stand for our own dignity. And so there's here a very beautiful moment where Kant is saying love, but don't do it, never do it to the point where you lose your dignity, right? You matter. <laughs> Because if you lose the dignity, remember, we talked about this, right? Once you lose yourself in the person, right? This is exactly when the love begins to die, actually, right? So you're trying to protect the love by losing yourself in the person, allowing them to control you. But in fact, when you're doing that, this is exactly when the love will begin to die, where the other will start to lose interest, right? So that's something, Kant is not worried about that. He doesn't care about your love life, but definitely he's worried about the dignity of ourselves and other, other human beings, right? So, um, so that's the idea, right? So now we are ready actually to tackle the problem we talked about, the cheating one, right? Now, based on what you know, uh, your now you should be a little more in tune with your other voice, right? The higher voice of reason. Tell me, uh, what would the higher voice of reason prescribe? Would it prescribe allowing the person to cheat or not? What what, what would be the answer, Donaldson? Go ahead. I think uh, based on what we've learned, you know, cheating. Uh, well, I would probably still do it to help my friend would be a moral breach. Uh, you would be disrespecting your own dignity. Okay. So I think, um, you know, Axel's answer and um, somebody else also said, Suleiman, I think uh, Suleimanov said they he wouldn't cheat either. And I think this right. would be the, the voice of re reason speaking in this case. Exactly, right? You, you would do it, but I, I, I'm ready to bet, you know, uh, that you would feel slightly uncomfortable with it. Or if you had another option, you would pick the other option, right? The fact that most of you, if you had another option, you would pick the other option, tells me that there's something problematic about allowing the person to cheat, which is precisely this, that you're allowing them to use you. Right, so here the loser here is your rational being, right? So, uh, and I know this, right? Because many people think, but no, cheating is okay because you know um, it's helping the other person, right? But still, given the choice, if there was an alternative, you would most certainly pick the alternative. That tells me you you feel conflicted still, right? There is a conflict, and it's that's your reason. That's your reason saying, ah, be careful, right? Now, I want to go a little deeper in that because this there are ramifications to this thought. Kant is basically saying. There are things that we're going to do out of a sense of our humanity, right? That we have to do, but it doesn't take away from the moral problem, right? Let me give you an example. Uh, Kant talks about in a section about uh, lying, right? So basically, and, and he's been, by the way, uh, criticized for his uh, views on lying. And, and he responds in the last essay of this book, if you're interested, but uh, Kant is saying, right? Lying is always wrong, right? Um, because of course, when you lie, you are trying to manipulate the other person, meaning you're using them, right? You're trying to exert some type of control on the other person. And anytime you do that, it's a breach on their dignity. So Kant is saying lying is always wrong. So then someone will say, well, Mr. Kant, you lived in the 18th century, but had you lived 200 years later, what would you have done if the Nazis had knocked on your door and asked you, are you hiding any Jews, right? And, and Kant actually defends himself. Right, and he says, the consequences are not my problem. I would have followed the higher moral law, right? And so it, it's slightly outrageous. He would not have lied, right? Uh, and then <laughs> everybody would have been killed, right? So it's, 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 a, it's a very extreme example, but I actually want to make an argument for Kant right now. Let me make an argument for Kant uh, really quickly. What Kant is saying, is that yes, sometimes it is justified. Well, he's not saying that. I'm gonna use Kant to say this. Using Kant, I would agree that sometimes, yes, although it is justified to lie, we understand why you lied, 
And sometimes it is even justified to kill. I understand why you killed. You had to defend yourself. You had to protect your family. You had to lie. Sometimes you have to steal, right? In order to survive, to protect your family and so forth in these very extreme situations of war, right? Kant would say, yes, it's justified, but it's still a moral problem, right? There has still been a moral breach. And I agree with him on that, right? We should never let go of the moral problem. Right, even if you kill and we understand that it's justified, that you know you had to do it to protect yourself and to protect your family, it doesn't take away from the moral problem, the moral issue, the moral breach that has taken place, right? And, and I think we need to address that. Uh, let, let me bring it very uh, home actually with this, this um, analysis I have made of PTSD right, um, army veterans who come home with very severe PTSD and, you know, who are not really able to uh, process all of the violence that they have been forced to commit, right, because this is what it is, they have to kill, right, they come home and they're given basic services, but what they're not given is the opportunity to process the moral transgression that has taken place. I really believe that as long as we don't, uh, uh, face the fact that every war entails moral transgression, even if it's justified, it's understandable, we have to do it, it's a necessity, still there is a moral breach that needs to be processed. And until we bring these veterans face to face with the moral transgression, with the moral breach that took place and help them process this, right? Maybe through the process of forgiveness, forgiving of themselves, right? Um, they will not overcome the PTSD. You can't overcome the PTSD by just, you know, whatever, taking, you know, medication. <laughs> They'd be quiet because they treat PTSD as a, you know, a mental illness issue. It's a moral issue. There are moral roots in PTSD, right, that our veterans are suffering. And so I agree with Kant that we, yes, sometimes it's justified to kill, to steal, to cheat, to lie, right? But we should always, uh, we should remain always sensitive, right, to the moral struggle. There should always be a moral struggle. Otherwise, we will completely silence this voice, right, which is so uh, important, which is the only voice that makes us human, right? So uh, am I making sense here with my whole uh, explanation of um, PTSD and, and uh, you know, killing is justified, but morally problematic, right? So maybe you can write this down that sometimes killing, cheating, lying is justified. We understand why you did it but it, it has to remain morally problematic. Otherwise, if you just act like nothing happened, like it's fine, the voice here of reason will slowly become softer and softer and you are in a way subduing, uh, uh, repressing that voice, which one day you will not hear anymore, right? And at that moment, it is not only your humanity, but the humanity of everyone around you, which is jeopardized, right? Okay, so that's just a few words on that, just to go a little further. Um, Okay, great. Any last questions, comments on Kant before we conclude? Any things that, that is unclear or any things that you disagree with or you want to clarify? Now is the moment. We have a few minutes for that. Um, Sanchez, do you have a question? Oh, no, I was just going to agree with everything you're saying because like, it's, it's very important to acknowledge like how it's affecting things on a larger scale. Um, but yeah, I was going to also mention like when I heard about like the effects of PTSD and those things like with the soldiers. Um, I'm pretty sure they've done research with using um, certain type of psychedelics to help them with that. And it's helped a lot. And I think that it's a good move towards um, the future to have this very professional way of healing people um, and help them go through that journey. Right, very good. Yes, absolutely, right? The use of psychedelics to open up the, right, to, to, to help people a process, right? And, and I would add to that, right? A moral component. There's a lot happening in terms of helping veterans overcome, but I think the moral component has not yet been acknowledged. Why? Because then as a country, we would need to realize that war is immoral inherently. And we can, yeah. because that's our way of life. So we, yeah. we, have, we will never yet, I don't think we're ready to deal with it on a moral basis, because as a country, we are not yet a, um, ready to acknowledge that there is a moral problem with war. Yeah. Right? Um, so very good. Anything else before we, anybody else wanna add anything? 
Okay, so let's call it a day. Uh, let me just go over what you need to do by next week. So we meet again next Tuesday. Um, let's see. Um, so you have your test. So remember, you have two questions, one for Rumi, one for Kant, one page each, uh, single spaced. Then you have your essay. Remember that the essay is 50% a moral crisis, a story. One single, pick one problem they're struggling with, and then 50% is you trying to respond to the problem, bring in some wisdom from the class so they can unravel the problem, uh, maybe resolve it. Uh, that's 1.5 pages, single space. And then, uh, so you have that for this weekend. And then, okay, then next week we start uh, Kierkegaard. So he's, um, uh, very, very nice, very beautiful writing, but very dense, right? We're getting into some more dense uh, literature. So um, you, of course, listen to the recording, you do the audio question. You guys did for the most part very well. So I think you've, you've got it, how to do it. Uh, you do the reading assignment and that's it. Okay, so just a reminder, I need to see Celia Fatakov and um, Sanchez at the end of class and whoever else needs to stay for questions. So let me stop the recording.